Maybe you can have that. We tell the story with a heavy heart uh, this week with the events in Louisiana, and Minnesota, and Dallas. Let's take a moment of silence. Amen. Bonnie and I are here to present a case study. The setting, time is the fall 2014 semester. The place, St. Louis University. We say SLU, home of the Billikens. Many of you were on our beautiful campus three years ago when the colleagues in Jesuit business education met in St. Louis. A lot has changed in St. Louis since 2013. We not only have a new logo and a new Billiken, uh, we have a new president. Fred Pastello, previously president here at Lemoyne, was inaugurated as SLU's first lay president on October 3rd, 2014. 10 days later, at 1.30 a.m., he was awakened by a phone call. It was Jim Moran, head of SLU's Department of Public Safety. Mr. President, Jim said, I need you to make a decision. You have two to three minutes. There are over a thousand protesters marching towards the main campus. We can see them. Police are on the scene. What do you want us to do? Crowd is chanting, hands up, don't shoot. Back from Russia. There you go. These are the dormitory halls of St. Louis University in the background. The protests were peaceful, with no signs of violence. There was tension, certainly. President Pastello chose not to block the protesters from entering campus. He chose to meet peace with peace and to trust. On the left is an image of SLU's campus and its clock tower on an ordinary sunny fall day. On the right is the scene on the misty autumn night that unfolded after President Pastello's decision. The campus leaders presumed the protesters would leave after a few hours. Unexpectedly, two dozen remained, setting up tents in an occupation of the area near the clock tower. When it first happened, the protest on our campus briefly made national news. But we think the most important parts of this story occurred in the days that followed. It was midterm week. To clarify, the occupiers weren't protesting any specific action at SLU. Rather, the protesters settled on our campus as a place for their voices to be heard. The details offer a case study in leadership. Viewed through our respective disciplines, I'm a philosopher who teaches ethics, especially virtue ethics, and Bonnie is an economist who's interested in voluntary exchange and negotiated transactions. We see this case as offering lessons about how a situation rife with potential for conflict, was transformed into a peaceful, cooperative exchange. President Pastello likes to point out that when he went to president's school, no one taught him how to manage a campus occupation. To be sure, President Pastello is a key character in the story of Occupy SLU, but the story is complicated and includes a large cast of characters, administrators, staff, faculty, students, activists. We interviewed a lot of people who participated in this case. Many people practiced the virtues, especially courage and prudence, rather than acting out of fear or thoughtless impulse. 
Many people involved in this case made decisions to engage in reciprocity, choosing to trust instead of resorting to coercion, command, or control. To understand the story of Occupy SLU and the case of the Clock Tower Accords, a little bit of background will help. Bonnie. Thank you, Greg. On August, August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown was shot and killed by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. According to the account that circulated widely through the black community, Michael Brown had his hands up in surrender when he was shot. Michael Brown's body lay in the street in the sweltering August heat for more than four hours after his death. The community was enraged. More than a week of civil unrest followed. Some protests were peaceful, others were violent. Soldiers from the Missouri National Guard were deployed. Protesters were tear gassed. Protesters were shot with rubber bullets and wooden baton rounds by militarized police SWAT teams dressed in full riot gear. All of this happened in the otherwise ordinary small St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri, just 12 miles north of the SLU campus. On any given day, our night SLU's dean of students estimates that some 50 SLU students were out on the streets of Ferguson with scores of other young people protesting. October 10th through the 13th, protesters from around the country gathered in St. Louis for a weekend of actions called Ferguson October. As those events were being organized, a call came in to SLU requesting space for an interfaith program, the one you see right there in the middle of the screen. President Pastello offered SLU's Chaffetz Arena at no charge. But his decision was controversial. A number of his executive staff and trustees objected. SLU, the argument went, should not put its brand, its image, at risk by hosting a Ferguson October event. Just four days before the event was to take place, another young black man, Von Derrick Myers Jr., was shot and killed by a white, off-duty police officer just two miles south of SLU in the Shaw neighborhood. President Pastello called a meeting. There was serious talk about scratching the event scheduled to be held at the Chaffetz Arena. A black faculty member present at the meeting argued that SLU's mission demanded that values and not fear drive decisions. Despite serious objections, from his staff, from trustees, from the Division of Public Safety, President Pastello decided the event would go forward. And he knew if anything happened, his presidency might well be over. The program that night was beautiful. Cornell West was there and gave a brilliant speech. But the program was also difficult befitting the difficult topic of social injustice, it was also awkward because of its place, its presence in a place of evident white privilege, and because historically, SLU has not engaged its majority impoverished black neighbors. As the event came to a close, one of the organizers called for the crowd to leave the Chaffetz Arena and move out into the streets. And so at roughly 9 p.m. that Sunday night, a large group marched from SLU two miles south to the site in the Shaw neighborhood where Von Derrick Myers had been killed for an impromptu vigil. Over a thousand people eventually gathered. Two student activists played key roles in the events that followed, Alicia and Jonathan. 
Alicia and Jonathan had been out on the streets of Ferguson for weeks, putting themselves at real risk. And Alicia and Jonathan were disappointed in SLU. SLU was not sufficiently engaged with its hurting neighbors and was not living out the Jesuits' prophetic call to a faith that does justice. In their minds, SLU was not acting true to its values, nor was it living out its mission. Alicia was at the arena for the event that evening and marched with the crowd to the vigil. Jonathan had to work that night, and he was on campus. At some point during the vigil, activists agreed to march back to SLU. Alicia and others led the way. Back at SLU, Jonathan was alerted and he gathered a small group to await their arrival. As the marchers reached SLU, there was roughly a five minute pause as SLU public safety officers blocked the entrance to campus. And then Jonathan, dressed in a black hoodie and standing at the front of the crowd, raised his ID in the air and declared, I'm a SLU student, and I have a lot of guests. <laughs> Here's the scene as it unfolded. Listen for those words from Jonathan. Listen up. Listen. I'm a slow student. I have a lot of guests. I have my ID, and I have a lot of guests to accompany me. All right. <laughs> Marchers settled in around the clock tower. Four and a half minutes of silence were observed for Michael Brown, Von Derrick Myers, Kajami Powell. Von Derrick Myers' father gave a moving speech of thanks. Other speeches followed. Here's a couple. Absolutely. Down these systemic issues that we deal with every day of our lives. Black, white, brown, blue, red, everybody suffers from these issues. And this thing right here that we're doing right now, this, this is not only a symbolism of what we can do when we stick together. This is, this is it, it, it's the beginning of a change in our consciousness as a people, as a human race. I'm an African-American male here at St. Louis University. Make some noise, please. What's Thank you. Hey. I'm getting my degree in business management with a minor in economics. I want to let you guys know. Freshman year, I came here. And this school preaches diversity, this school, this school cre preaches inclusion, but freshman year, it was something that I didn't feel. It was something that I didn't feel. I don't want every slew student to listen to me right now, all right? We have a responsibility. This isn't a bubble. I know you see the trees, you see the nice infrastructure. This isn't a bubble. You step out, there's a community hurting right now. Amen. As students, we have a responsibility 
We have a responsibility. You and your fraternities. You and your sororities. I don't care what your color is. I understand you guys have a, you guys have a responsibility to this community. We're about inclusion. We preach it. We need to live it. You understand? Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you guys. And then when the protest might have ended, the protesters decided to stay and set up camp. A call was put out for tents and supplies, and so began the occupation. A hashtag was needed, and Occupy SLU was born. Within hours, Occupy SLU was the number one trending hashtag. Phone calls, emails, post to SLU's Facebook page came flooding in, and they were angry. And many of them were overtly racist. Donors were threatening to withdraw their support. President Pastello was under attack. He was also very alone. He was newly arrived in town. He didn't yet know his board of trustees or even his executive staff. He had inherited them all from the previous president, who had been forced out under difficult circumstances. He did know that some trustees and some of his executive staff were not on his side. As President Pastello put it, he had one hell of a problem. He was under intense pressure to solve it quickly and decisively, to take command, to demonstrate control, to end the occupation. He called an old acquaintance crisis manager, Bob Gagney, who immediately flew into town. The executive staff and a few faculty members assembled, and President Pastello put the question to them, What's the quickest way to get rid of this problem? Bob Gagney interrupted and said, stop. Tell me what are your values? What is your mission? As the conversation continued, it became clear that the only thing to do was to make values-based decisions. The objective remained, get rid of the protesters, but the call to mission had created the opportunity for a values-based approach rather than a fear-based command and control action. Throughout the week around the clock tower, impromptu speeches were made and conversations started. The university organized formal teach-ins and intergroup dialogues. Some of these encounters were fruitful, but others were not. Midweek, Tensions reached a dangerous peak bordering on violence when a protester dragged an American flag around in the dirt. Angry calls and Facebook posts again flooded in, overwhelming the administration. And social media posts suggested that external groups were making plans to come to campus and take their own actions. On Thursday, the director of SLU's African American Studies program arranged a meeting between President Pastello and Alicia and Jonathan and two other activists. Pastello asked them, how can we bring this to a conclusion? And the protesters responded, why should we trust you? And Pastello explained, because my neck is on the line. Because I offered the Chaffetz Arena because I allowed the protest to enter campus, because I have not had you forcibly removed, and because if this goes badly, I'm gonna be gone. And the next guy's gonna be far less sympathetic. Thursday night, Alicia and Jonathan and some other protesters associated with a group called Tribex gathered in a classroom in Xavier Hall. Some were in no mood for any sort of agreement in exchange for an end to the occupation. They didn't trust Pastello, and they hadn't occupied the campus with the intent to make any demands. For others, though, Pastello's willingness to engage was a game changer. Since the start of the movement in Ferguson, it was the first time, the very first time, protesters had been invited to a table. It was the first time someone in a position of authority had treated them as equals, as partners with whom to cooperate, rather than as malcontents to be controlled. 
reciprocity seemed the right response. Moreover, all the pressure on Pastello, ironically, meant that the protesters had the clear upper hand. The sense was that Pastello would agree to almost anything they asked for. And the next day, an agreement was brokered. It became known as the Clock Tower Accords and consists of some 13 points. The agreement was signed by Pastello and representatives of Tribex, M Slice and Slew's Black Student Alliance. And in exchange, the protesters agreed to end the occupation by 10.30 a.m. the next morning. The next morning, the appointed hour came and went, and the protesters weren't gone. A local civil rights attorney had been called to the scene by a protester who was unhappy with the agreement. And the attorney was arguing that the agreement was bunk and could not be trusted. One of the protesters sent a text to Pastello that there was trouble brewing. The agreement was falling apart. Pastello was beside himself, and he set out for the clock tower alone. The protesters and the attorney were seated up towards the top of the amphitheater that flanks one side of the clock tower. As Pastello started up the steps, he faltered, and Jonathan reached out his hand to help him up. Others were not so welcoming and greeted Pastello with a barrage of harsh language and name-calling. Pastello was a snake in the grass. Alicia and Jonathan were sellouts. Stephen Bradley, and Uncle Tom. Pastello did not chastise or lecture the protesters on proper civil discourse. He simply answered their questions and spoke to their concerns. Conversation went on some 20 minutes or so, and then Pastello left. Except for a single holdout, now curled up in a tent, the protesters agreed amongst themselves to abide their promise and to end the, end the occupation. Pastello's choice to listen and to engage face to face across what was a clear cultural divide had been pivotal. The protesters found it difficult to leave. The clock tower had become a kind of sacred space. The university arranged for a truck to come, and the last of the encampment was loaded up. As we understand it, that truck was filled to the brim. The truck pulled away, the protesters were gone, and the work to implement the accords could begin. Thanks, Bonnie. We hope this condensed version of events from St. Louis during the summer and fall of 2014 provides enough of the story to help point to some lessons. The revived interest in virtue ethics in the contemporary academy and the way in which virtue ethics is the traditional and highly developed grammar of Catholic and Jesuit moral philosophy provides us with a vocabulary for describing the traits of excellent leaders. It takes courage to stand strong in the face of fear, and to draw upon a sense of mission in a time of crisis. It takes practical wisdom to listen to people with different perspectives and experiences, to deliberate, to make good judgments about entering into a relationship of trust with others. The case provides an opportunity to view the discipline of economics as the study of exchange, cooperation. Trust and reciprocity, which are vital for cooperation, are evident throughout the case. While this case is very dramatic, it seems to us that its lessons are important for the not-so-dramatic day-to-day decisions that executives, administrators, and managers make routinely, and the way in which making good decisions requires exercising the virtue of practical wisdom. Management through command and control is very tempting, especially in a crisis. However, practical wisdom involves recognizing when what's needed is dialogue, reflection, and shared deliberation. It's through conversation and exchange 
that a fuller realization of the truth is pursued and embodied. Practicing the virtues may thus point toward managing with wisdom and acting as a leader who is a steward of an organization's mission rather than through command and control. We hope this, help, this case helps people consider when those who are in leadership positions in an organization should engage in exchange rather than resorting to the use of command and control as a means of solving problems and getting business done. Jesuit mission played a key role in the positive outcome of this case. Pope Francis has challenged us to become aware of what he calls the globalization of indifference. Catholic and Jesuit spirituality reminds us that Christ is present in every human life and in a very special way in those who are poor or marginalized or forgotten. Living out such a mission frequently is difficult for those of us at institutions with the Jesuit mission. However, many of our graduates are going to find themselves working in secular contexts or in organizations not guided by the same sense of mission. We hope this case will help provoke reflection on how our graduates can find ways to live out Jesuit mission in the context of secular organizations that may not have an explicit commitment to respecting dialogue and the shared pursuit of common goods. Thank you.